everybody for a new colloquium. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mathilde de Lalin from University of Montreal. Mathilde got her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. Then she had post -doc several postdoctoral experience, such that the Gray Mathematical Institute lift off fellowship and the PIMS postdoctoral fellowship in Vancouver. Then she got a tenure track at uh, Alberta University of Alberta before finally moving here in Montreal. She has won several prizes and awards, such as the Krieger Nielsen Prize of the CMS, and she is a fellow both of the American Mathematical Society and of the Canadian Mathematical Society. And today she's going to talk about sums of the divisor function and random matrix distribution. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you, Giovanni, for the introduction. Um, so this is, I have to warn and see uh, the audience is heavily in the number theory side, uh, but a big, a substantial part of my talk is for, for general audience. Um, okay. Okay. So I'm going to start with a very basic question. So if we have an integer number, a positive integer number, then how many uh, positive divisors does the number have? So for example, if we look at 120, Okay, so here's a list of positive divisors, and uh, you can write them all. And they are 16 of them, you can count them. And you can count them in a smart way without having to write all of them. Um, if we take into account the factorization, okay, so we write, uh, so can I point? Yeah, oh, maybe that's not, yeah, no, maybe I shouldn't because it's so, okay. Let's be like that. So if we write 120 as uh, the factorization in, in prime factors, then we can count the divisor by just looking at the exponents um, of the prime factor because we know that the exponents will be, say if we have two to the three, then a divisor will have, will be, uh, uh, have two to the A with A that can be from zero to three. And, uh, and the same for the exponent of three, well, that's just one, so it could be exponent zero or one, and the exponent of five will be either zero or one. Um, and so when you count all the possibilities for the exponent, that gives you 16, okay? And so in general, you can apply this reasoning for any uh, positive integer, writing the prime factorization and counting the exponents. Now, um, we're interested in understanding this function in a more general way. So the question is, what can we say about this device or function in general? Okay, so if we try to approach this problem by, okay, so one thing we can do is just write the first few uh, values. Okay, so here's the table with 10 values. Okay, that doesn't, one, two, two, three, two, four, two, four, three, four. Okay, that doesn't say much. Um, Another attempt we can do is to graph this. Uh, okay, so here's a graph of what the divisor function gives you up to 250. Um, but you can see that it's a bit hard to say something in general, okay? And the bottom line, uh, both figuratively and literally in the slide, is that it's hard to predict the behavior from just having this formula with the exponents. Okay, so what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is try to take an average, okay? So we consider the mean, okay? So the sum of this number of divisors uh, for n up to certain x, okay? Say x real or yeah, so it's natural to think of, to try to adapt a real function. So we take X real and we divide by X. And if we graph this, then we get something that looks much nicer. Um, obviously this will have a bit of variation, okay? But if you look far enough, this looks like a very reasonable curve, okay? And in fact, it is a very reasonable curve. Um, actually the, the graph, that we're doing there is um, y equals log of x plus two gamma minus one, where gamma is the euler mascheroni constant. Okay, so gamma is the limit when n goes to infinity of the sum of one over k to n, 
um, minus log of n. Um, so if we take so the first graph, the graph on my um, on your left is going to be the graph that we had before. So this average of the divisor function and the graph on the right um, is, is this um, log of x plus two gamma minus one. Then actually this is fun. Okay, you can put them together and they look, yeah, they coincide a lot in, in certain sense, okay? But of course we want to understand this, okay, so we want to formulate this in a precise way and we want to understand how close these things are. And the result uh, that, okay, so the first result that we have is the theorem of Dirichlet. Uh, so Dirichlet show that the sum of dn for n up to x is equal to x log of x plus two gamma minus one x plus an error term that has um, size of O of square root of x, okay? So by this, I mean, it's a function that uh, when x goes to infinity, behaves like a, maybe like a constant uh, times the square root of x. So the whole point here is that this O of square root of x grows more slowly than the other uh, terms in my expression. And so, so it's an error term. It's a small variation to us. Uh, okay, so this is the only proof that I'm going to do uh, today. So, okay, so we want to estimate the sum of the n for n up to x. Okay, so one way of doing this, you can think of the n, <clears throat> okay, so as a number of ways of writing n as a product of a times b. And, uh, and the order, it matters here, okay? So because the n is counting the number of divisors, so say that the n is counting the number of possible a's, okay? And the b is given by whatever you need to reach n. And so summing for all the n up to x is the same as summing all the possible products a, b, order, that are less or equal than n, okay? So just counting how many you have of those. And when you have a product like that, a times b um, equals something, then at least one of them has to be smaller or equal than the square root of the final product. And so we can count this in this way. So we can either uh, ask a to be smaller or equal than the square root of x, or b to be less or equal than the square root of x. And if we do this, we are, we are counting the, the case where more of them are in our case or x well done, well done, so we are at once, once. Now, now, for the first two terms, the ones where a is less or equal than square root of x or b is less or equal than square root of x, well, those really, these are double sums, but the inner sum is b less or equal than x over a. And that that is just the, the number of integers you have up to x over a. And so you can write that as two sums, two identical sums of um, n up to square root of x of the integer part of x over n. And then the term that we have to subtract, well, that is just the integer part of a square root of x to a square. Now we can try to, okay, so let's try to be more precise. Okay, so summing over the integer part is not ideal, okay? So we can replace this integer part by just, okay, forget about the integer part, okay? And just write x over n, but of course that will introduce some error. Okay, so we do that. We, we replace this integer part of x over n by x over n. And so that introduces an error that is, the size of the, the number of terms that I have in my sum. So it will be O of a square root of X. And then um, there is the other term that is the square of the integer part of a square root of X. Okay, that we can replace it by X. Okay, and there is another error that is introduced, but I mean, this can be absorbed in the O. And then the only thing that remains is that uh, the sum of one over N, we want to approximate it with the log. Okay, but when we do that, this is when we get this gamma. Okay, so this Euler-Mascheroni constant, okay, comes from 
approximating the sum of the reciprocals with the log uh, yeah, of the upper bound in the sum. And so you do that, okay? Uh, you have to be careful here because the sum is up to square root of x. So when you take log, you get the one half, but that simplifies with the two. So that's how you get x log x, okay? And uh, there is this gamma here, so it's two x gamma. So that's how you get the, the two gamma x. And, uh, and there is a minus x over there. And then the error term, in the end, the term that contributes the most is this error term that we have with all square root of x. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how you can get this approximation. Now, you can get better approximations. Okay, so basically getting a better result for us would be to get a better error term. Okay, smaller error term. Um, so you can get better by considering the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss much about the Riemann zeta function. Uh, just to mention is the, well, you can define it as a sum of uh, from n equals one to infinity of one over n to the s with S is say a complex variable with a real part bigger than one. So this sum converges, but it actually has a metamorphic continuation to the whole complex plane um, with a pole at S equals one. Um, this function, um, this sum can also be written as an infinite product going over the primes. And this identity, um, you essentially prove it by uh, looking at uh, factorization. So it's essentially the, um, the theorem, the fundamental theorem of arithmetics, okay? The, the fact that there is unique factorization. It's a very beautiful thing. Um, the Riemann hypothesis is a statement that the zeros of the set of function that have real part between zero and one actually had to have real part equal to one half, okay? And what this gives is an understanding, a, a, a really good understanding on the distribution of prime numbers. Okay, so the more precise uh, you can describe these zeros, um, the more precise your understanding is, okay? And for us, it also gives us something um, so if we start with the Riemann zeta function with, uh, with this expression of, with the series um, of one over n to the s, and we take the square, okay? So we just have two factors now, but now we can regroup this in a smart way. Um, so instead of just summing over a one over a to the s and over b one over b to the s, let's put together a and b. And so when we do that, say a times b is n, okay? So then we end up with the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n to the s, and the coefficient that counts the number of ways of writing n as a product a, b. Okay, but that's the divisor function. So basically, if we take the square of the Riemann zeta function, we get this divisor function um, divided by n to the s. So we get a series that is like the Riemann set of function, but it has a coefficient. So this is a Dirichlet series. It has a coefficient of d of n. Okay, so with this, actually, one can estimate um, this sum of dn for n up to x in a different way that I'm not going to describe in detail. But the idea, so it's called Perron's formula. Um, and the idea is that when you have a series that looks like this, okay, you can get an estimate of the sum of dn by taking certain, certain complex integral of the generating function here. So of this Dirichlet function here. And this is a line, it's a complex integral in a, in a vertical line. And if you want to estimate what it is, you can close it in a rectangle, okay? And then, um, and then you can you end up computing basically a residue, okay? And uh, and so essentially, this sum ends up being 
a residue, a complex residue that, um, well, it gives you the main term that we had before, so it's not a surprise. And then, um, but then of course you need to understand what happens in the three sides that you added to compute the, to complete the rectangle. And then when you do that, actually you get better error terms. So you get O of a cubic root of X. So, so that's an improvement. Now, this idea that we use is in the zeta function, okay, that, that we apply. Okay, there's nothing telling me that I cannot take like a higher power of the zeta function, okay? So to get the, to count the divisor, to get the divisor function, we took the square, but we could take the k power. And when we take the k power, we get, okay, another coefficient that we call it dkn, and this dkn is a number of ways of writing n as a product of k factors that are ordered. Okay, so you can think of the um, d of n that we had before as a number of ways of writing n as a product of two factors. And this is a number of ways of writing as a product of k factors. So basically the function we had before was d2. And, and so, well, this is kind of an obvious statement given the first line, but um, DKN, the understanding DKN is, is associated to understanding the K power of zeta, okay? Um, and, and understanding the K power of zeta is associated to DKN. So basically there are two motivations here. So you could be interested in DKN for the sake of DKN, um, but you could also be interested in that because you are interested in powers of zeta. And the powers of zeta, I'm not going to discuss this, but understanding the powers of zeta is connected uh, to understanding better the Riemann hypothesis. So, so it's actually pretty important to understand this DKN. Um, okay, so what can we say about DKN? Well, what we have for D2, uh, so here I wrote the statement again for D2. And now we have, we can ask about the sum of DKN. And what is known is that, okay, so you can actually do the same type of um, proof. Okay, so the, both the Dirichlet argument and also the zeta function argument, they both extend to DKN. And um, the result that it gives is that there is a main term that is given by x times a polynomial in log of x of degree k minus one. Um, so like I said, the case dn is with two. Uh, so it will be a linear polynomial in log of x. So you have a linear polynomial in log of x. So here's the, um, yeah. So term of degree one and here's the term of degree zero, okay. Um, and so in general, you have that. So for example, I wrote here the first few. Okay, so this is the one that we have for D2, then the one for D3, for D4. Okay, the coefficients are, um, have to do with the coefficients of the um, Lorentz series of the zeta function around S equals one. Okay, and obviously they become more and more complicated. <coughs> now, if we want to understand this type of formula better, then, Really, we have to understand the error term. Okay. And so the question is, what can we say about the error term? Well, this is a method gives that the error term is essentially bounded by x to the one minus one over k times the power of log of x. Okay, so the, the one we did in detail was with k equals two. And we have the square root of x. So that, that is consistent. Um, if we use a zeta function, then we're going to get a better error term. So we're going to get x to the one minus two over k plus one. Um, so we are subtracting something larger from that one. Okay, so it says the final exponent is smaller. Um, and, but what we will expect to have is x to the one half minus one over two k. So we will expect to have something smaller than square root of x. Okay, so what can we do uh, to, to study this? Okay, we can do the same. Um, okay, so we can apply the same mentality that started the whole discussion. So because we want, when we wanted to understand d of n, we took the average. 
And here we can also take an average of the error term and see what we can say. Now, the problem with the error term is that we don't know the sign. I mean, it could be positive or negative. So if we just take an average, we will not answer So what, what we have is take an average either of the value or another thing that we can take an average of the square. And so that gives the variance. So here is the type of result in this direction. So we take the square of the error term and we, well, here we have a continuous function. So we integrate in some interval between x and 2x, okay? And it, what is known actually is that is the right size, okay? So there is an asymptotic that gives constant times x to the one minus one over k. Now, if you remember, or you don't have to remember, I have it here. So the size, the expected size is x to the one half minus one over two k. So when you take the square, you get rid of these twos. So you get x to the one minus one over k. And on average, it gives the right size. So this is good. This is known for k equals two and it's known for k greater or equal than three, assuming the Riemann hypothesis. Um, now, in, uh, if we want to understand things further, okay, if we want to push things further, there are questions that can be more precise, okay, than just the average. We could ask, for example, what happens if we take the average, but only restricted to an interval. Okay. And we control the size of the interval. So obviously, if we want the better understanding we want, the smaller the interval should be. Okay, so this is what is known as this average over short intervals. So that's one direction. Another direction that we could use to understand things is going over arithmetic progressions. And so what, the, what that means is that instead of taking the sum over n up to x, we take the sum over n up to x with a n restricted to some congruence modulo some modulus, okay? So modulo some q. Um, and of course here, um, in a sense, okay, so for the first case, the shorter the interval, the more difficult this question is. And for the second case, the larger the modulus, the more difficult this question is, okay? So this, this Q, the larger the modulus, the more sparse this is, and in a sense, the more information you are giving uh, in certain sense. Okay, so the, the problem I'm going to be kind of focusing and comparing with has to do with the second question. So let me tell you, what are the um, things that we are considering? Okay, so we are considering the variance here, okay, because we want to understand this error term. And the way we are going to compute the variance has to do with taking the sum, subtracting the average, taking the square, okay, and doing the sum over all the classes that are co prime to Q, okay? So when you look at N, modulo Q, okay? You don't want the cases where, you know, you can simplify further, okay? You don't want the cases where A and Q have some common divisor. So you are going to look only at A co-prime to Q. So both for computing the average and then for computing the variance. Sorry, what and is then, Q? What is phi? Phi, okay, thanks for asking. Phi is, uh, is just the euler toshen function and it's counting the number of uh, numbers that are co-prime to Q, positive numbers that are co-prime to Q and less than Q. Oh, thank you. Mm? Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking, I, I should have mentioned that. Okay, so, the, so basically we are taking an average here, so we are dividing by the number of terms we have. So the number of terms is the number of A's that are co-prime to Q. Um, classes, A classes that are co-prime to Q. Okay, um, so what is known about distribution over arithmetic progression? So this is just a very small part there. There is a lot of work on this and related to this. I just want to mention a few things and I'm not even mentioning the results, but several people work on this. And there are results for k equals two and q 
up to x. Okay. Um, so the important thing here is where q lies respect to x. Okay. So q up to x, that's, that's very good. Okay. But then for k up, uh, k starting from three, then you have this restriction that x is greater than q to the k minus one half. So you should think about this as, you know, q goes up to x to the one over k. Okay, so Q is a small respect to X. So it's not as good. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. Um, well, okay, so there are concrete results like that. Okay, but there is also conjecture due to uh, Keating, Roger, Roditi, Gershon, and Rudnick, where they conjecture the following. So for the case where Q is prime, and this is really a technical restriction. It's not um, that, um, it's just to write things better, okay? Um, and X in a very large interval between Q, essentially between Q and Q to the K. So it's a much larger interval than the results that are known. Then they give an asymptotic for the variance of this sum, okay? As X goes to infinity, okay? It, and the asymptotic is as follows. So it takes, X over Q multiplied by a constant. So this AK is some arithmetic constant. So it's a number depending on, on K and it's, it's rational. And multiply by, okay, so here comes the function involving the log of X. Okay, we have log of X before, we have log of X here. So the function um, involving the log of X is a piecewise polynomial function so it's a function that is continuous and is defined in intervals. And so for each interval between two consecutive integers, it will be defined by the polynomial that has always um, degree k squared minus one, except, okay, so it's between zero and k. Outside, below zero and above k, it will be zero, okay. And it's, okay, even though we have k polynomials, it's continuous. Okay, and if you look at how it is evaluated, it's evaluated in log of x over log of q and then multiplied by log of q to the k squared minus one. So you can think of this as making the, the homogeneous polynomial in two variables, okay, and making it an homogeneous polynomial in k squared minus one and evaluating in log of x and log of q. Okay, so, Okay, so how do they come up with this conjecture is super general compared to the results that are known. Well, the way they come up with this conjecture is by obtaining the, the result in a different context, the context of function fields. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Okay, the context of function fields has to do with, instead of working over the, say, positive integers as we were working up to now, we consider polynomials with coefficients over FQ, FQ being a field with um, Q elements. So if you don't have experience on that, um, just think of the integer modulo P with P prime. Okay, that's a field, okay? Um, but they are more general fields that are finite. So the whole point is that a finite fields and Q will be a power of a prime. Um, so you consider polynomials, okay, with coefficients in, in this field. So basically the whole point here is that for a fixed degree, you have a finite number of polynomials, okay? Because for each coefficient, you have a finite number of options that the, the coefficient can take values, okay? So this is quite key here. And then when I say working over rational, over a function field, I'm thinking about say, uh, yeah, the field of, of, of fractions of the, of the polynomial ring. Okay, so here are the faces that uh, Dimitris wanted to see. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's a kind of internal joke because I, um, yeah, half of my talks have this slide. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, so this is a bit of, um, to give you an idea of, why this function field setting is 
very close, very analogous to the rational setting. So on the left, I have a number of fields, okay? And on the right, I have function fields. So number of fields, okay, will be, of course, extensions of Q. I, don't, I didn't write the extensions of Q, I just write Q here. And the function field will be um, extensions of final extensions of FQT, but I'm just writing FQT. Um, so FQT, the rational functions of, with coefficients on FQ will correspond to Q. Um, the polynomial will correspond to the integers. Okay, so here these two rings, they have unique factorization, they are very nice. Um, the, the primes in the integers now on the function field, they correspond to monarchy reducible polynomial. Okay, so I should say the positive primes in the integer correspond to monarchy reducible polynomials. And there is also the idea of uh, the norm. Okay, so there is the idea of size. So if we have an integer, or if we take the absolute value, that gives us an idea of size. And we can think of it as the number of classes when you take. Uh, the quotient of the ring by the idea generated by M. And so if we translate that idea into the polynomial, so we are going to quotient the polynomials by the idea generated by F. And uh, if we look at how many elements we have there, we have Q to the degree of F. So we have, again, a finite number that we can use as an idea of the size of F. And so in the same way as we have the Riemann zeta function defined over the, as a sum over the n integers, say, we can construct a Riemann zeta function defined as a sum over um, the f monic, okay? And here we take one over the norm of f to the s, okay? So that we have a number there. And one, uh, one thing that happens is that over the, well, over the number of fields, the Riemann hypothesis is a conjecture, and over the function field, the Riemann hypothesis is true. And in fact, for this function, I leave it as homework. It's really easy to, it's really easy to prove, okay? Uh, so you just need to, to, to write this sum in terms of the degree of the polynomials. Um, but, this is this analogy of much hyper than what I'm writing my slide. I hope uh, said really, really ten tensions. So, and this, and this my, my face, face now is a theorem. It's so it's one of the big conjectures. So, non trivial big theorem. Um, now, okay. Um, okay, so. How, again, how do they reach this conjecture? Okay, so what happens is that over function fields, these, these variance um, ends up being related to an integral over the set of unitary random matrices. Okay, so here's the definition of unitary matrices um, so that we know what we're talking about. So let me explain a vague idea of why the unitary matrices show up. So, when we look at arithmetic progressions, okay, so one way to pick up, okay, what do I mean by pick up arithmetic progressions? What I mean is I want to do the sum over the ends that are restricted to certain congruence modulo Q, okay? So one way of doing is that by playing with signs. So for example, if I want to restrict the congruence modulo four, okay, well, one thing I can do is take this character Okay, so this chi n. Okay, so what do I mean by that is the following. So instead of taking the Riemann zeta function, I'm gonna take a sign in the numerator. And this sign will give us one when n is congruent to one mod four, minus one when n is congruent to three mod four, and zero when n is even. Okay, so more concretely, essentially, you get that. Okay, so one over one to the S minus one over three to the S plus one over five to the S, et cetera. Now you can play with this and combine it with the Riemann zeta function or say the Riemann zeta function going over only the odd numbers. You can play with this and then recover, okay, with taking plus or minus, you can recover, say the n that are congruent to one mod four or the n that are congruent to three mod four. 
Well, it turns out that you can do exactly the same game over function fields. Okay, so you're going to write a function like that. But then the characters there are really, really nice. And so, okay, this you have to believe me. Um, it's going to be a finite sum somehow, even though you define it for infinite um, for infinite many polynomials, okay, because you know, as the degree goes up, you, you have infinitely many polynomials. At a certain point, when the, the degree of the polynomials is large enough, um, somehow the combination of the character evaluating all the possible polynomials will have to give you zero. These are called orthogonal relations. And so because this is a final sum, it is, in the end, it's just a polynomial in one over Q to the S. And so you can write it as a polynomial in one of, uh, over Q to the S, okay? Um, so you just can factorize that. And then what happens is that, um, okay, so the vague conjecture that I kind of mentioned before tell you something about the size of this, um, the roots. Okay, it's not really the roots, it's kind of the reciprocal of the roots, okay, the way I wrote it. But they tell you that um, these pi j chi, they have to have absolute value square root of, uh, the, yeah, they have to have absolute values square root of q. And so what happens is that at the end, you can think of this polynomial as some characteristic polynomial of some matrix. And after extracting this square root of uh, q, um, you end up with a unitary matrix. Sorry, okay, so what is chi, chi of f? What is chi of f in uh, uh, nominator? Okay, this chi of f will be a character defined over the polynomials. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes. So I'm not, it's analogous to what I defined here over the integers. Mm -hmm. Thank, yes. you. So Thank you. For the, one example could be something that detects whether a polynomial is a square modulo. Okay, so this is is uh, detecting, for example, whether minus uh, well minus one is a square modulo four. Okay, so it could be something like that. Um, but that, that's just an example. Okay, so this theta uh, chi is actually defined up to conjugacy, and uh, it's a unitary matrix. And then there is a well big work of uh, Katz and Sarnak based also on work, previous work by Delin. Okay, so this big work on that, that essentially predicts that the statistics for the zeros of, um, of these L functions, or these type of L functions in certain families um, should follow distribution laws of classical random matrices as Q goes to infinity. So basically, yes, this is extremely vague what I'm saying, but, um, you basically consider certain families, and then depending on the families of the L functions, this will give certain property to this characteristic polynomial. And so um, according to how the characteristic polynomial behaves, one can predict uh, how these um, eigenvalues behave. And so the other cases that uh, show up will be symplectic and orthogonal, okay? Um, so, in the problem I described, and also um, Keating, uh, Roger, Roddy Gershon, and, and Rudnick, they study also a problem over short intervals. And in both problems, they show up as unitary matrices. Now, the question that started our project had to do with less, okay, so let's find a problem that gives you a symplectic or orthogonal distribution, okay? Um, so basically that was a question. Like if you have a problem that gives you symplectic and orthogonal distribution, can you get something similar? Can you get a similar behavior? Can you get the same kind of, you know, piecewise polynomial function, et cetera, et cetera. And so, well, so we started with symplectic uh, because it's easier. Um, so it is known that uh, one can get symplectic distribution by taking, uh, for example, L functions associated to uh, quadratic 
uh, so quadratic extensions. So say we start with, okay, so this will be a curve. In, so there are two variables involved here. So y squared equals g of t. So t and y are my variables, okay? And so this will be associated to some quadratic extension of fqt, okay? So it will be fqt adjoined the square root of d, okay? And, um, and so th there will be an n function associated to this. And okay, as you change D, will be a family of L functions. And now, Katz and Sarna proved that this is associated to symplectic distributions. Oops. Okay, so the first attempt was to, okay, take the divisor function. Okay, so the sum of the divisor function. Now, instead of restricting to A mod Q, okay, so we have a Q before. It's a bad choice, but uh, it's always a <laughs> capital Q. But anyway, instead of restricting to some congruence, okay, we are going to restrict, we wanted to restrict to some square. Okay, so to the text square. So the F goes over the square module of something. So that was the first attempt, but actually it wasn't a very good uh, thing to do because it's not easy to detect squares with the character. It's easy to detect squares when you take the character modulo prime. But when you take a character in general, okay, so this is not the Legendre symbol anymore. Um, so then we said, okay, let's take a square modulo P. Okay, so this works, but actually this push the difficulties to some other direction. Um, so, but let me tell you what, what we get, okay? so. Um, so we take the sum of dkf with f monic degree of f equals n. Fixing the degree of f is the equivalent that we had before to n less or equal than x, okay? Um, f congruent to a square modulo p, okay? And p is a monic irreducible polynomial of fixed degree. And the degree is odd, this is technical. Then we were able to compute the average Okay, so that's not very difficult. And using the average, we were able to find an asymptotic for the variance. Okay, and the asymptotic for the variance looks as follows. It has Q to the N. This is like the number of elements um, that I'm considering. Okay, the number of polynomials that are considering, the numbers of polynomials at degree N divided by four times some integral over the uh, symplectic matrices of dimension 2G, where 2G plus one was the degree of P. And the integral we're considering is the square of the sum of certain, I would say certain, yeah, product of coefficients of the characteristic polynomials of the matrices, okay? So, yes. What, what is the variance here? Okay, so is the variance of this sum. So you take the sum, the average is given by that. Okay. Although you compute the variance using the main term and not this. So that's why we have a star there. Okay, and then we take the variance. So we take the sum. Oh, we are summing. Yeah, so we are uh, summing the, the, all the different, um, yeah, we are summing over all the f. the f. Yeah, of degree n. So n is fixed. Well, that's the definition of your sum. And you have, this is your random variable and that not only depends on n and p. And you want to take the variance of this with respect to what? Uh, p? Well, to p. Yeah. You yeah. Sum over all okay, you sum over the primes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Sorry, sorry, what is the difference between uh, between uh, P or oh, sorry? Between P and? And G. Yeah. On previous page, there was G on previous slide. And now P, what is the difference between them? P? Bet what was the polynomial G on previous slide? Modulus yeah, so P. D and now it's modulus yeah. P. What is the difference? Okay. The difference is that P is monic irreducible. And D is just square free. I didn't discuss that on detail. Sorry? D is a square free. And P is D, D capitals, D capitals. There was. Yes, yes. yes, there was D. 
Model D, uh, what's the difference? Right? And P, sí, P and D. It's a, it's a, it's an arbitrary polynomial that is square free. I didn't say before that it's square free, but this is just an arbitrary polynomial of fixed degree. So the first thing oh, that we wanted oh. to do was to sum over things that are square module or whatever. Okay, but it turns oh. out that if you do a square module or whatever, things get very difficult. So then we restricted the whatever to P, to a monic oh. reducible polynomial. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Okay, so this statement over, ooh, okay. Um, okay, so let me just say, this statement over function fees is very analogous to the statement, I didn't give it in detail, that, um, that the other author got for unitary matrices. In fact, it's exactly the same in integral, okay, except that you have absolute values. And instead of going over the symplectic group, you go over the whole unitary group. Now, Okay, maybe just quickly uh, the, some ideas in the proof to use. Um, okay, to use the character to detect the square module of p. Okay, to use the L function in in this character. Okay, to recover the DKF. Okay, and then to use some equidistribution result of cuts. Um, so the I, I mentioned before that the result known to cuts and Sarnak was uh, over the whole family of y squared equals d. Now we had the question of y squared equals p or with p going over irreducibles. And so for that, we had to work, okay? And uh, actually we got some help from cats to do this. Um, so, but basically, yeah, you have to do some finer work to understand and then you recover again the symplectic group. Um, okay, so, once you have this result over function fees, you want to translate it into result over number fees. And so there is more work associated to that. And this is also work that uh, the other author did over the, for this integral over the unitary matrices. We have over the symplectic and that brings some additional difficulties. So the setting is a bit, well, quite more complicated than that. Uh, so one of the difficulties is actually the square. Uh, that we get in the in the sum, um, and basically to get this gamma, poly, this piecewise polynomial function, one has to understand the asymptotic as n goes to infinity. So as the dimension of the matrices goes to infinity. Okay. So in the original problem, this dimension was associated to uh, to g plus one. Okay. So to the degree of p. Yeah, so that's the coefficient of, um, oops, yeah, sorry. Let me go back. Yeah, that's the coefficient of, they are called security coefficients and they are the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial with this normalization. So is it even clear that the integral converges because the symbolic group is not a complex group? Um, yeah, but I don't know if I can answer this a priori, if I can but give you an intuition. Uh, no, the difficult is more like uh, the combinator. Okay, so there are nice formulas for this, but uh, without the square. It's more like a combinatorics difficulty. Yeah, I want to mention uh, this a bit. Okay, I should hurry up. But um, So basically, there is a nice, description so of the generating function of a well very general generating function associated to this integral so if we if we integrate the product of characteristic polynomials like that actually that can be described as some uh, some sum over sure functions uh, that are essentially generating polynomials associated to some uh, semi-standard young tableau that we are Okay, we're counting some particular Yang tableau. And then, okay, so this is a very general uh, statement from symmetric function theory. And then if we specialize in a smart way, um, okay, so instead of taking just a product of our uh, uh, characteristic polynomial, we, we take 2K 
And, uh, and so we, we make some, the first K variables equal to each other and the other, the second K variables equal to each other. Then we are going to get, let me see if I wrote, okay. We are going to get the, the integral in the diagonal terms. So the terms that have the same degree in X and Y. Um, so if we didn't have the square, the things will be much easier because everything will take the same characteristic polynomial and we will uh, have just one variable. So like I said, this is combinatoric difficulty, but uh, uh, yeah, non-trivial. Um, okay, so once we have this description, we can play with this, okay, uh, to get to predict what's the behavior of this integral when capital N goes to infinity. And so, so one thing that happens is that, okay, if we, if we relate small n with capital N, we can actually um, see the integral as counting the number of lattice points that lie in some dilation of a polytope. So we can describe using this true function, we can describe the points of interest as inside some polytope. And then this capital A will change the size of the polytope. And we're just counting the number of lattice points. And that will give us the value of the integral. And so by Erhard theory, this gives a polynomial in N of certain degree. And this is a piecewise polynomial function that I mentioned before. Uh, for the symplectic case, it has degree two k squared plus k minus two. And also using the short function, we can actually compute in some cases, the integral directly. Okay, in the cases where things are uh, particularly simple. Okay, so this short functions has actually a nice expression in terms of some determinant. Um, and so, well, this looks too nice actually. It's not as good as it looks. In the sense that working with this is not easy, okay? Uh, so it's some determinant divided by van der Monde and bunch of products, okay? So you have to kind of equal some variables. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting computation, but with that, we can get some particular values of this, this piecewise polynomial function. And so once we understand, okay, or what, whatever understanding we have, then we can formulate a conjecture. Um, Okay, so my conjecture is over the number of fields will be um, taking the sum of n up to x of the k n. Okay, when n is congruent to a square modulo p, okay, and p, uh, p doesn't divide n. Okay, and then what we want to do is uh, we want to take again the variance. Okay, so before. P was moving over all the reducible polynomials of degree two G plus one. Here we want to move P, but not too much. Um, so what we do is we take a dyadic interval. So interval of the form Y to Y, okay, to replace the fixed degree that we had before. And, uh, and well, we had to replace many elements by, for example, we had Q to the N that gets replaced by X, et cetera. Um, and so this is, the, this is a conjecture that we have. So it has essentially the same shape as the, as the conjecture uh, that the other authors have. And um, yeah, so essentially that shape, but okay. Let me mention um, one more thing. So I said there are, there is, also, there is a symplectic, but there is also the orthogonal uh, distribution that appears in some ways. And uh, so we look for a problem that gives us an orthogonal distribution and we found one, even though it's not great. Uh, in, in the sense, it's not super natural. Um, it has to do with understanding distributions of Gaussian integers. Um, so first we study distribution of decay evaluated in Gaussian integers. Um, restricted to certain circular sector in the plane. And here, let me just mention for, for the number theory people that we are only looking at uh, essentially one quadrant. So, because we want to look at uh, things up to units. Okay, so essentially it's one quadrant. Um, and 
we are going to restrict the argument between in some angle. Okay, so we can study a problem like this, and that problem gives symplectic distributions. Now, um, to study this, we use some model over the function fields. Again, um, modeling Gaussian integers over the function fields so is super interesting. Uh, now, we can twist this problem, again, literally and figuratively. If we twist this problem, we get orthogonal distributions. Uh, so to get orthogonal distribution, we have to twist by some character um, that essentially for a, for a prime, for a prime in the Gaussian integer, we count the number of ways of writing it as, as a sum of squares than I. So it's a very weird condition uh, that has to do when a prime over the Gaussian integers is the norm of something on the field adjoining the A roots of unity. So it's like the sum of squares that one has over the integer, but you know, up. Okay, so you start for the prime in Q adjoin I, and you ask when is the sum of squares above. Okay. Um, so associated to that, again, there is an orthogonal distribution there, and we can formulate the question over that. Okay. Um, this is actually quite interesting. The, the inter integral that we get, okay, is very similar to what we had before, but now over the orthogonal group, and uh, it requires some extra work, some uh, things that we couldn't find in the literature and for, from the symmetric function theory that we had to reprove, actually, or well, prove, but we couldn't find them. Um, anyway, so let me just finish. Okay, so for the orthogonal case, we get the polynomial of degree two k squared minus k plus two. And so what's, what's in the future for this, this project? Well, I mean, there's a lot of room for exploration. So one thing I uh, have to do with better understand is why it's quite a bit of a bit of a bit of so we can still ask questions about lower terms. About um, I didn't discuss it. There are certain nice integral expressions in the unitary case that we still don't have for the syntactic and orthogonal case. Um, there is also something that I left under the carpet that has to do with these uh, arithmetic coefficients. These arithmetic coefficients don't come out of nowhere. I mean, they come from comparing random matrix models of integrals with um, the corresponding moments on L functions. And so there's work to do to actually, so for the unit case, it's a concrete formula for this AK, but we don't have it yet for the syntactic and orthogonal cases. Um, we can also redo all of these with, instead of the device of function, von Mangold convolutions. And as the device of function comes from powers of the set of function, von Mangold convolution comes from power of the logarithmic derivative of the set of functions. So, and they are associated again to understanding distribution of primes. Um, and, and also many of these things also can be translated into other families of L functions. So for example, higher degree L functions are associated to elliptic curves. So there is some work of uh, Keating and other collaborators on that. Um, so one could also ask questions. So, okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Matilde, for the talk. And now, questions? So, uh, did you also proceed by analogy in the orthogonal case where you were looking at Gaussian integers? Yes. Yes. And what was that? Let me. Yeah, it's a bit. Um... <laughs> yeah, it's a bit contrived. Okay. Sorry? Well... It's a bit artificial, the, the condition, okay? So basically what you're looking is, you're going over, okay, so it's better to think in terms of ideas, okay? So it's generated by this Gaussian integer. And so, so you are counting the device of function on these ideas with norm bounded by X, okay? And you are restricting the argument of the generator to certain interval of arguments in the unit circle. Um, and then this is the part that is a bit, uh, yeah. yeah. The, okay, so you take the character and the character is like I said before, 
So it's a character defined over the primes in the Gaussian integers by taking one if the prime can be written as a sum of a squared plus i b squared with a and b over the Gaussian integers. So this is a condition that is a bit strange. Uh, and then you extend it multiplicatively. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so this is somehow detecting, you get one, okay, so this one plus chi two of alpha over two. Uh, so this gives you one when, when chi two of alpha is one and zero otherwise, um, yeah. Yeah, so let me maybe maybe I can explain a bit more why um, this is so artificial. Is because the so the the bottleneck in in this story that uh, is really hard to deal with has to do with understanding which family had uh, this orthogonal uh, distribution, and so so for that we went okay. We look at results of cuts okay. Um, so basically, there is an industry <laughs> of people asking cats questions, and then he published a paper that is called a question, on a question of blah and blah, okay, where he proves that there is um, uh, one of these symmetries. And, um, and basically, yes, yeah, so the only one that we could find uh, yeah, had this problem. So that's why the problem is weird. So we went kind of, we reverse engineer from a family of L functions to get the problem in over number fifths. The modular forms are one of them? Hmm? The modular forms is the classical orthogonal family of the right? Yeah. Uh, 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 we don't have, uh, yeah, we weren't able to have a nice version of, yeah, over function fifths. So because here we need nice, yeah, we need something nice over function fees that is well understood over function fees, yeah. Sure you <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, we have to have a good reason to, yeah. because I mean, if we go and just ask about things that are natural, you know, they he may come back with, okay, this is unitary. <laughs> and in fact, this is how we got help for the first problem. I mean, we asked him, we were hoping that we would get, uh, a paper, him to write a paper on a question of Hooper and Lalin, yeah. but it took him only 24 hours to, okay, we asked him why squared equals P, you know, Monique reduce your polynomial. And it only took him 24 hours to return. Uh, he said, oh, I don't know this. And then after 24 hours, he comes back and says, oh, it is simplex. So <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, no, it was nothing. I mean, he yeah. kind of gave it to us. So then it's part of our paper, but then it's really, um yeah so it was a bit disappointing but also thank you. <laughs> can you say a few words about this issue of restricting to a quadrant because uh, this is one aspect of the question is how to see how you generalize to i don't know okay it comes to quadrant but it was set uh, yeah. No, no, we are not really okay. So I, 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 um, we are not really restricting to a particular. Okay, ah, restricting to a particular sector. Okay, so that. Uh, okay, not not the quadrant. Okay, yeah, that. Yeah. So basically, um, yeah, you can use. Okay, so this is very similar to. Uh, oh no 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 so it's restricted to the argument so you take okay so you think of this idea that's generated by some alpha okay up to the units okay and so you take the argument of alpha okay you write that as e to the uh, four i theta okay so that you don't see the units and now this theta is restricted. And so, um, yeah, so over the, the function field, okay, so it comes from the function field setting. So you are restricting. Um, yeah, so, so it has to do with, 
with combining with uh, certain characters. And in this case, you're using super even characters. And uh, so you're, yeah, you're modeling, basically, uh, you're modeling the Gaussian integer with, um, yeah, so you, you, you model, okay, so a unit circle, uh, yeah, okay, I'm thinking. Okay. But, okay, yeah. In the in, in random matrix theory with the orthogonal in three and I think it's like for one, two, four, right? Say that again. So the orthogonal uh hard orthogonal or hard in three or or synthetic where you have beta one, beta equal two, beta equal four, where beta is inverse temperature. I'm sorry, I don't understand two four. Oh, okay. So, um, okay, the eigen values of random matrices. Yes. Right? The, the interaction of that, which is repulsion. Right? It's a random one to a power. Right? Yes. So, for the world is power one, for unitary is power two, and for quaternic, uh, it's basically power four. And that's what this model the It has a three fold symmetry, right? depending on the quantum system, which symmetry it has. And I was wondering if those conjecture with the asymptotics, you can kind of rewrite them as. A beta where you would match with the equal one to equal two to equal four, your three point vector. Okay, so it would be like a finer thing? Not really finer, it's just like uh, can you see the beta in your K or your gamma or your powers? I mean, you can see it. Um, in principle, you can see it in what you expect the eigenvalues to be in the L function family. So it has to do with what a function family you take. And but I guess it's just wondering if it's AKS or it's gamma S UK, right? You have a three, four, you have three conjectures. You have gamma O, gamma S, and gamma yes. U, right? and gamma U, you know, because it's easier to compute. But also, it's the conjectures to write everything in terms of one and so on. We see which would be time and the matrix theory. Yeah, I don't think I know yeah, enough to answer. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Matilda again. <laughs>